Rory Lawton joins me from Berlin, Germany this week to discuss the German beer purity laws. This is Beer Fifth Podcast number 141. This is Beersmith Podcast number 141, and it's late January 2017. This week, Rory Lawton joins me from Berlin to take on the controversial subjects of efforts to amend the 500-year-old German beer purity law. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're running an amazing deal right now, only $19.99 for a year-long subscription or $17.99 for the digital edition. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for home brewers and beer lovers. You can read my new column called Ask the Experts there. Take advantage of their special deal now at beerandbrewing.com. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com. And also the new BrewVision thermometer from Blickman Engineering. The interactive wireless digital thermometer connects right to your phone or iPad and lets you remotely monitor and record temperatures. You can download your recipes right from the Beersmith Cloud and set up updates and alerts as you brew. Get the BrewVision Bluetooth Thermometer today, another innovation from BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And also Beersmith Software, the industry standard for home and professional brewers. It lets you design great beer recipes and brew with confidence. Download your free 21-day trial today from Beersmith.com. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, my guest is Rory Lawton, coming to us from Berlin, Germany. Rory is a writer in Berlin who has actually been campaigning with a small number of German beer brewers uh, to challenge the status of Reinheitsgebot, or the beer purity law. Uh, he's also working to promote the rediscovery of Germans' uh, historical beer culture. Uh, so today we're going to have a discussion about the law, its history, and implications for German brewing. Rory, it is uh, great to have you on the show. Thanks, Brad. It's an honor to be here. I'm, I'm delighted to be able to talk about it here. So from Germany, from uh, ground zero. Um, yeah, interesting to, to, to have this discussion with you and give my own perspective and see how things are in Germany at the moment. So you're uh, you're in Berlin at the moment. Uh, I'm trying to think. Say it's about what, what a five, six hour difference, I guess. Something like that. It's a six hour difference. Yeah, it's, uh, it's the late afternoon here at the moment. Um, I, I'm originally from Dublin, Ireland, but I've been living in Berlin for over five years now and uh, have been working within the industry on and off for the last uh, four years or so. So seeing the new craft beer breweries emerge, also talked to the, the larger breweries and been involved in the different beer festivals here, done beer tastings and founded the Berlin Homebrewing Competition. Uh, right. So I've been involved in all aspects of, of the beer culture here in Germany. And, and most importantly, you're a home brewer, right? Most importantly, I'm a home brewer and uh, have some useful software to help me out. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, well, I'm glad to have you here, and I, I think the German purity law, which uh, many of us here in the U.S. are familiar with, uh, celebrated its 500th anniversary in 2016, so it goes back to uh, 1516. Uh, I was wondering if you could maybe discuss a little bit of the history around the original declaration, uh, which was in 1516, and, uh, and how it came about. Sure. So there's a few things that we're going to have to untangle in the course of this conversation, but yes, yeah, starting with the original 1516 declaration there there was a declaration uh on the 23rd of april 1516 in um, a bavarian city called ingolstadt and remember at the time that bavaria was a much smaller country uh much smaller than than the bavarian state is today in germany um but there was a decree uh, on the 23rd of april 1516 where the duke uh, william the fourth and his brother ludwig the tenth decreed uh, in a Bavarian state regulation that beer brewed in the summer and winter um, should be charged a certain amount for different kinds of beer. And then as an aside, it was mentioned that only water, barley and hops should be used in the brewing of beer. So historically, there was a document signed on the 23rd of of April. Um, So this 500 year anniversary does tie into that. Um, the Brewers Association in Germany chose that because it was the decree that probably had the, the, the largest uh, lasting impact. Um, there were other decrees which we can talk about earlier, but uh, the one from 1516 is, is the one that you know, uh, had a certain amount of status over the, over the coming centuries. And uh, just to clarify, what did the original decree actually say? 
So the original decree was was a tax law. Um, it stated it was largely about you can find it online and, and there's an English translation available as well. It it stated the different prices that uh, needed to be charged uh, for different kinds of beer, setting an upper limit on them, um, and it restricted uh, brewing to water, barley, and hops. And what's interesting there is that it, there was no mention of malt and no mention of yeast at the time. Now, it was understood that yeast was uh, important for brewing. It wasn't understood as a, you know, as a, as a fungus at the time. But um, there had been discussions between bakers and brewers about the role of yeast and who was responsible for paying for it. So I think we can, we can let that one go, go aside. But what's more interesting is that it, it declared that uh, barley should be used for, for beer. And the reason that barley was mentioned was uh, that uh, at the time, you know, food wasn't as plentiful as it is today. And wheat and rye uh, were very useful for baking bread, but uh, barley was actually not so useful for baking. Uh, but uh, barley is excellent for, for brewing beer with. So that's why barley was stipulated. And the, the decree was really to keep wheat out of the, the breweries. And uh, then the control of taxes on, on barley for brewing and uh, wheat for baking could be separately controlled. Which is kind of ironic because now Bavaria is very well known for their wheat beer, right? <laughs> That's that's correct. Yeah, that is correct. But uh, wheat beer has had its own interesting history, which which has often been forgotten. But I think we, we can get onto that that particular aspect later. Um, there there was at the time um, there was a habit of putting other things into the beer. So it's it's not that this was 100% a tax law. If you look at the document, you'll see its its purpose is quite clear. But at the time, there were other ingredients put in to bitter the beer. Um, beer was being made cheaper and cheaper. The brewers at the time it was a lot more work than it is today to make to make the beers. Um, so, you know, different spices could be used, um, uh, bittering ingredients other than hops could be used. Um, some of these were deemed to be poisonous. So there were, uh, food safety concerns at the time, but that wasn't the, the, the basis for this decree. If, if you look at the original text, it's quite clearly a tax law. Interesting. So, um, this thing's now taken on somewhat of a mythical status, of course. Uh, can you tell us about some of the true history versus some of the myths surrounding it actually? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's really the reason we're having this conversation is that the myths have almost taken over from the, the realities, from the facts that are readily available. And it's changed so often in the last 500 years that, um, you know, we really need, get, need to, to, to re-examine what's, what's being said and what was originally said. So the myth that's, that's often repeated and that I've heard uh, a lot in the last year, so in 2016 was the 500 year anniversary, is that uh, something like this, the, the Reinheitsgebot from 1516 is the first and longest continuous uh, consumer protection law that guarantees the quality of German beer. And you'll see this over and over on when websites and in leaflets and in the celebrations that took place around the 23rd of April uh, 2016. And I want to unpack this a little bit because um, almost every single aspect of this, of this statement is, is untrue. So the, the Reinheitsgebot itself, so the, the purity law would be the English translation, isn't really from, from 1516 at all, but uh, is a more modern term that was only introduced formally in, in 1918. So Reinheitsgebot, the word, um, this is a phrase that's often used to talk about German brewing heritage, to talk about the different uh, restrictions, and to also talk about the modern German tax laws. And we need to be very careful when we talk about Reinheitsgebot, what are we actually referring to? And uh, I often say that this is a game of switcheroo that's played. So the defenders of the Reinheitsgebot will often use it to defend exactly what they're looking to defend. And then, um, you know, to talk about the German beer culture as if the Reinheitsgebot is responsible for it. But Reinheitsgebot itself, the word didn't come into German practice until uh, 1918 when it was first formally documented. And it has been used. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, no. I was just asking, is that the same time that the law became German? Was it was applied Germany wide or was it done? Because I know originally exactly. it was only Bavaria, right? Around the same time, originally Bavaria, and then um, you know Bavaria became part of the the, the German Kingdom in in, in 1871. Um, but the, this law applied to all of Germany in 1906. Um, but at the time, it was it was a tax law. Um, but in in 1918, it was documented in the Bavarian Parliament that uh, that advertising is becoming more and more uh, important for the brewing industry, and that something like the Reinheitsgebot. Therefore, it would make sense to use an expression like this. So that's the first one. That the word itself is important that we, we, we clarify what we mean when we talk about the purity law, Reinheitsgebot. And um, what, is, what does the word mean if, if I was translating it to English? 
Yeah, ah, so, Reinheit, so Reinheit would mean purity, and uh, Gebot is, is a law. So it actually, the, the technical translation would be, would be the purity law. Hmm. Makes sense, um, yeah. Um, so, so what's often said that this is the first and continuous, uh, continuously running consumer protection law, it certainly wasn't the first. And this is known, um, for example, the, uh, in 1487 in Munich, there was a separate uh, purity law uh, signed by Duke Albrecht IV. Before then, there was another one, the Statuta Taberna in Weissensee uh, from 1434, uh, which was also restricting what brewers could do uh, in the Mashtun. So it's certainly not the, the first law of its kind, um, but it did have widespread uh, impact and, and then later widespread appeal. So 1516 is a nice marketing term um, and to use the, you know, the, the, the law as it applied to all of Bavaria, but it certainly wasn't the first. Um, the next part I wanted to tackle is that it was continuous. Uh, it wasn't continuous at all. Um, it was often ignored in the last 500 years. And, uh, you know, brewers would use um, other grains. Um, in terms of filtration techniques, you know, they, they were using Isenglass even in Bavaria as late as the late 19th century. Um, so it, it wasn't enforced. It was enforced only at different points. Um, and it certainly wasn't continuous. Um, it wasn't a consumer protection law at all. Um, the, the, the price of the beer was fixed and the brewers were told uh, what they could put in their mash tons, but it had nothing to do with consumers. And in fact, it doesn't even mention beer quality at all. Um, you know, at the time, there would have been a lot of spoilage. This is before the time of, you know, single, single yeast strains being isolated, which didn't happen until the uh, 19th century. So beer would have had varying quality at the time. This was known and, and continued to have varying quality for the next 500 years or 400 years. But uh, there was certainly no uh, no mention of spoiled beer or what to do with spoiled beer. Um, and the original statement doesn't mention yeast or malt. So, um, you know, in, in that sense, the, the, the law itself has changed. So uh, wheat had been ad was added later and then there were further restrictions about top fermenting and bottom fermenting yeast that were introduced over the next centuries. So in terms of con continuity, there's, there's, there's no continuity there at all. Yeah, I had... So uh, in go ahead. No, so just to, to, to finalize then, in terms of this, this uh, marketing gimmick that's used, that this is a continuous uh, consumer protection law, I, it kind of falls flat on its face, no matter how you, how you look at it. Yeah, I had uh, Randy Mosher on last year talking about beer history, and he would, you know, basically if you pull apart the, the myth behind almost every single beer style we can name, uh, history is messy. You know, it, it doesn't always, <laughs> it doesn't always uh, follow the myth, if you will. Uh, almost all the styles that we talk about today have a have a sort of a mythical stat, you know, myth mythical history, and then we start actually pulling it apart. It it uh, it comes uh, it becomes a little more complicated than that. Well, that's what makes this discussion really interesting. Um, and you know, what's happened in the last four years, particularly with the craft breweries from the U.S. and this rediscovery of, of these beer styles, I think is an interesting conversation. And I think it's good that we we don't get everything perfectly right the first time, but at least there's an interest in different beer styles. And if you look at how the myth of the IPA has changed in the last 10, 15 years, you know, um, I think it's interesting. It gives us something to talk about. But as long as we respect the facts when we find them and we look for original documentation when we find them, and then we, we make adjustments, to example, the the BJ. CP guidelines, I think, are a very useful document. I challenge some details in that, particularly with the home brewers and, you know, judging particular beer styles, where maybe American brewers have been overzealous in, you know, in their interpretation of history. But as long as we're open to correction, then this is all useful. We can have fun in the meantime. Um, we can, you know, rediscover beers and then try and fine tune their historical accuracy as well. But we need to be both uh, passionate and respectful for facts when, when they appear, even if they're inconvenient. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we had, um, we were talking about Scottish ales a short time ago as well. And same thing, almost all yeah. the Scottish history that you talk about is, uh, is not quite what you think it is. You know, it turns out there was all kinds of beers brewed in Scotland, of course. Um, that's probably true in Germany as well. Um, so the purity law evolved quite a bit over time. You've covered a lot of that, but, um, what does it actually look like today? What, uh, you know, what can you use? What can't you use? Uh, how does it, how does it apply? Right. So um, the beer law, as it applies today, is um, really as as the legal framework that's in place in Germany is the Biersteuergesetz. So that's the beer tax law uh, from 1993, and that has changed. Um, there were a few points in time when when the the, the beer law needed to be updated. So um, 
from 1906, the formal restriction applied to all of Germany. In 1918, you had the first use of the term Reinheitsgebot. The first Beer Steuergesetz, so Beer Tax Law, was from 1923. And there was a, another uh, change in 1952. But the most recent one in place is the, the uh, Beer Steuergesetz from 1993. And the old rules from... Um, from before, so the restrictions on what could and couldn't be put in the mash tun, so in terms of ingredients and additives, was carried over uh, as the vorläufiges Biergesetz. So the new beer tax law uh, from 1993 um, dictates all aspects of brewing, and in terms of the ingredients and additives, that's dictated by the vorläufiges Biergesetz. And what that says, um, it's very, very tightly restricted uh, for bottom fermenting beers, so Germans are very protective of their lager beer styles and is a little bit more permissive for top fermenting beer styles. And what it says is, is basically that uh, only malted barley, uh, water, hops and yeast can be used for bottom fermented beers. Uh, but for top fermented beers, you can add uh, other malted grains and you can, can add sugars, which isn't often talked about because, you know, German brewers rarely use uh, top fermenting yeast for, for anything other than, than wheat beer. Um, but um, there, there, there are uh, additional ingredients that can be used um, for top fermenting beers. So now, it potentially, also, you can make potentially an ale with, with sugar or, or other ingredients, right? Yes, you can. You can, yes. Uh, so, again, people talk about the Reinheitsgebot, and really they're talking about uh, the four ingredients, well, the three ingredients as listed in 1516, but then you allow liberties, you know, for yeast. Um, and they're, they're really talking about the German beer culture when they talk about it most often. They, they don't talk about what is permissible for, for top fermented beer styles. What's interesting, and in when, we, when we get into debate with the German brewers, is that no additional uh, ingredients are allowed as part of brewing, but that modern techniques um, do allow for other additives, clearing agents to be used as long as these can be taken out again and have no noticeable impact on the flavor or appearance of the beer. Interesting. So, I mean, you can, you can potentially use uh, things like filtering, I guess? That's, that's correct. And uh, you can also use uh, finings, I guess. Most, most finings, I would think, right? So this is this is what's open to debate. I mean, the German brewing industry has, has set itself up where um, PVPP is used, um, and you know I, most brewers will have no problem with PVPP, but it just goes against the spirit of the 1516 uh, ruling in terms of it, that it's a mar- modern filtration agent. It's it's definitely uh, you know artificial. That's a plastic, right? Isn't it? That's a plastic that's put yeah. into the beer and then like polyclar would be probably what uh, home brewers are familiar with. Polyclar is the same is PVPP, I believe. Exactly. But if you were to take something like Eger, so Irish Moss, or if you were to take something like Eisenglas, uh, German brewers don't use these um, because these would be seen as chemical filtration agents. And it's up to debate whether they could be defended as purely mechanical filtration or physical filtration, and if they would come out as readily as PVPP. Now, there are studies that have been done on PVPP that show that it's not entirely uh, filtered out of course it depends on 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 the the mechanical filtration techniques that you use or how long you allow to clear but um in in studies on um recently on 14 commercially brewed pilsner beers in germany um you know traces of uh, physical filtration um were were found in the beer and this caused a little bit of a stir because it's supposed to be you know uh completely clear by the time that the beer ends up in the in the bottle i mean technically just filtering the beer is going to change the character of the beer actually Correct. I, I mean, it's going to take out things. It's going to take out proteins. And, um, you know, you're a long way away from the manual brewing of the past um, when you do use such techniques. And again, this isn't about the, these techniques damaging the beer or making the beer worse. It's just that this is somewhat deceptive that the German beer drinkers uh, mostly believe that, uh, you know, only these the natural ingredients are used and they're not aware of how how uh, the filtration techniques change the character of beer because in the end what they see on the bottle what they see on the label is is reinheitsgebot and brewed according to the reinheitsgebot of 1516 so there's a little bit of a, a marketing play that's that's used to deceive the, the german beer drinker and these techniques uh, they they uh, don't have to be put on the labeling so on the label you will see water barley malt um, hops and yeast um, but uh, the brewers aren't required to put any of the the, the uh, other additives uh, onto the labels themselves interesting um what about other other you know uh, techniques have evolved pretty rapidly over the last 20 years what about other things like ph adjustment or uh, I'm, I'm sure there's other findings you could use 
Yes, so um, the, the laws themselves have been updated as, you know, technology improved in the, in the 20th century. And it's worth pointing out here that I, I think the, the brewing academies in Germany still produce some of the best uh, brewers in the world. We have a lot of brewers coming from the US, from Canada, from all around Europe, from South America now as well, to the brewing academies. And the, the technical brewing uh, expertise in Germany is probably second to none, you know, uh, in uh, terms of engineering, in terms of the education that's given here. So German brewers have been aware of the modernized techniques and have been applying them in their breweries. And the laws have been updated to reflect this. And again, there's nothing wrong with it as long as you're, you're, you're honest about it. But as we mentioned mechanical filtration, we mentioned PVPP, uh, pressure fermentation is allowed. You know, if you want to make beer in vast quantities, uh, uh, Pressure fermentation is allowed. Dilution post-fermentation is not allowed, on the other hand. So you, once the beer, the final gravity has been taken, the law says that you're not allowed to dilute the beer. So you can't make uh, high-gravity beers and, and then dilute them. And you can't, I um, assume you can't blend beers either then? Is that true? Uh, you can blend um, fob malt, so colored malt, to make a darker beer out of a light beer. But um, you can't blend beers and uh, call a beer an, an, a new beer style. So it, the, the, the rules of blending aren't as restrictive. You, on, the, on one side, you can blend uh, you know, uh, a dark and uh, uh, color as long as the color is extracted via brewing techniques uh, to make a dark colored beer. Um, but you, and you can also make a radler. So you can mix lemonade in beer as long as you don't call it a beer. But um, not for styles. German brewers don't blend different beers to make new styles as such. Um, in terms of pH, then, pH adjustment, you are allowed to use uh, lactic acid um, for dropping the pH uh, level in the mash tun. Uh, the lactic acid does need to be naturally derived, though. So, so it would be uh, derived from malt, I would assume? or So it will be derived from malt, that's correct. And this is mainly to satisfy... Uh, the the Rheinitz, but particularly in Bavaria. So the the purity law is uh, is controlled at each state level. So there's 16 states in Germany, and it's most restrictive in Bavaria still, where they don't really want to have anything seen as a chemical put into the mash tun. So the lactic acid is derived from malt, um, and is then you know poured into the mash tun. Uh, for adjusting the pH. And I've, I've worked together with Bavarian brewers and I've brewed beer down in Bavaria. And when they do this, there's a, they become a little bit ashamed that they're kind of cheating a little bit. And I asked them about it, um, you know, why it's not, not more public. And they say, look, uh, they don't really want the, the, the beer drinkers to know about this. It is naturally derived, but they prefer the beer drinkers themselves not know. And they say, you know, as a home brewer, you can do this with acidulated malt, which is true. But, you know, in the end, the lactic acid is chemically the same. Um, I don't see, I don't see any reasons for going to extra lengths to, you know, produce this via, uh, via malt, just so that you can get around historic laws that really weren't continues to begin with. Um, what about something like a rye beer, which is traditionally a German beer, I believe, right? That's correct. Yes. So um, if you're brewing a bottom fermented beer, you can't make a lager beer with rye. So you're still restricted to using 100% barley malt for a rye beer. Um, if you are making one, you can use top fermentation and use rye malt to, to make the beer. Um, so a brewer here in Berlin, for example, he makes his imperial stout with uh, uh, quite a large amount of rye malt. And there's no problem there. But if you're making a bottom fermented beer, um, you would be restricted from using rye malt. Interesting. Um, well, due to EU rules, I believe that beers that are imported into Germany uh, aren't actually subject to the purity law, which is an interesting twist. Can you talk, tell us about that? Yeah, this is really interesting. Um, so in Germany, the, the laws only apply to beers brewed by German brewers and sold as beer in Germany. So if you're brewing a beer in Dublin, for example, uh, take, for example, the Guinness Brewery in Dublin, uh, you can export that beer uh, into Germany and... Uh, you can sell this as beer in Germany. So the EU stepped in here uh, in uh, 1987 and basically said that Germans had a monopoly over over, over their beer uh, drinking culture, beer culture. Um, so uh, since 1987, uh, it is possible for brewers outside of Germany to sell their beer as beer in Germany without the, the laws applying. Likewise, and they the, can make uh, pretty much anything, right? I mean, they can they brew can anything. You can brew anything. So, um, you know, um, roasted malt, for example, is fine. You can use Isinglass for, for filtering. The, the Belgian brewers can add cherries to their small percentages of beer uh, that, you know, for Creek, uh, Lambic. Um, 
the 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 brewers that are making stronger higher gravity beers such as triple belgian triple will add 15 20 percent sugar and can get away with selling that as beer in germany so that's not a problem interestingly german brewers can also get around the laws or ignore the laws completely for their export beers so larger german brewers um have been known to uh to sidestep the rules and uh, make beers particularly for export uh, and sell them on the international market as beer, even though they wouldn't be able to sell them in Germany as beer. So this is kind of embarrassing for those brewers that have been caught out. Um, because it shows double standards, you know. So it, again, it only applies to German brewers uh, making beer to be sold as beer in Germany. Um, but that's kind of the way the German brewing industry, particularly for the larger brewers, that's the way they like it. They like the walls to be up, you know, around the the industry. Um, and they're not interested in taking these walls down for imported beers uh, or for, for um, you know, allowing more freedom internally because uh, the beer styles that are being sold today are largely the ones that these rules apply to. There was an interesting so, case for Guinness. Um, I just wanted to touch on an interesting case for, for Guinness when they were uh, challenged about 10, 15 years ago about um, the use of roast barley and the German purity law. So Guinness Draft uses roast barley, you know, to give you um, this roast quality in the beer, a certain amount of, of, of bitterness and dryness. Right, in, but in it, has, it hasn't been malted is the key point, right? It, it hasn't been malted. And because this is roast barley, uh, it's not allowed to be uh, used even for a top fermenting beer in Germany. So Guinness couldn't open a brewery in Germany today in, in 2017. And, and use roast barley, and even though it's a uh, top fermented beer, sell this as beer in Germany today. Um, but when they were challenged uh, online about, you know, whether this applies to the Reinheitsgebot or not, the, the head of marketing who came, came online and made a post, uh, he, 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 he phrased it very interesting. He said, he said no, our beers uh, do uh, meet the standards of the 1516 Reinheitsgebot, and we only use the natural ingredients, water, hops, and barley in our beer. And that was the perfect response. You know, he didn't have to go into the details about roast barley and whether roast barley is malted barley. Uh, and, and that's what the beer drinkers in the end are interested in. They want to know if it's natural or not. You know, if they want to know if they're being cheated or if they're chemicals. It's not about the, um, you know, whether, um, uh, how long uh, the, the grains were, were malted for or whether, you know, the degree of roasting, um, you know, means it's, it's malted or not. They, they're, they're just interested in, in, in the pure natural ingredients, and they don't really care about roast barley as, as a small uh, amount of the grain bill in, in an Irish stout. I mean, doesn't, doesn't uh, the fact that an imported beer can potentially contain anything put the, the domestic producers at somewhat of a disadvantage? Um, I think... I think it does to a certain extent. I mean, there are I mean, ways... Because there's a whole bunch of styles, for example, you can't brew. Yeah, that's that's true. But the, the, in Germany, the, the beer market for these beer styles is very, very small. So the German beer drinkers aren't really interested in, in Belgian triples. Um, they're not really interested in, in braggots. Um, even if you look at the beer styles for where the rules have to be have to get exceptions, for example, with the Goza or with the Berliner Weisse, the German beer drinkers aren't really interested. North in the north, two thirds of Germany, it's it's you know ninety five percent pills is consumed. In the south, uh, Hefeweizen uh, is the majority now since the nineteen sixties. But um, Germans predominantly are interested in German beer styles, so German pills and uh, Hefeweizen. Um, occasionally, they will be interested in the Bock at different times of the year, Bock beer, but um, they're not really interested in these other beer styles. And as long as the brewing industry, um, you know, tells them, the German beer consumer, that this is the best beer in the world and it has a long tradition and because of the Reinheitsgebot, it's the best beer in the world and it's guaranteed to be the best beer in the world, they, they're, they will be skeptical about trying any of these other beer styles. And I think this is one of the, the problems is because of the myth and because it is, has really taken root in, in the mentality of, of the German beer drinker, they're less inclined to try something new. So I think the, there are certain disadvantages for brewers, you know, in that their hands are being tied. But I think the, the advantages for the brewing industry, just mass producing pills, are far, far away those disadvantages, um, if you look at Germany as, as a whole. Well, I was thinking here in the United States, up until the late 80s, uh, probably even to the early 90s, um, you know, we started to have this craft beer revolution really in the 90s. And it, it significantly changed our drinking habits, obviously. We, you know, everybody was drinking, you know, Bud Light or Bud or, 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 or all these other mass-produced beers uh, uh, from really from World War II all the way up until 
uh, until the late 80s. And uh, nowadays, uh, the craft beer industry has just exploded. We have over 5,000 craft breweries. Um, I mean, can that even happen in Germany? Is it possible? Um, so I think there are different aspects of this. The craft brewing, I mean, we, we all look towards the U.S. when we see the success that the craft beer industry has had. And, you know, it was then going against the, the mass-produced Pilsner beers of the time. So in the 60s and early 70s, I think there was a, a real need for the brewers to, to, to rediscover the European beer styles of, let's say, Britain and, and, and Belgium in particular. Um, in Germany, remember, there's a, there's a longer tradition of, of brewing, a really rich brewing culture. And I think we, sh- we shouldn't forget that in this conversation where I've, I'm quite negative against the Reinheitsgebot, but I'm, the reason is that I'm very positive about Germany's long brewing culture. And in Germany, there are 1,500 breweries. In many of the villages uh, around Germany, you'll have beer that's brewed locally and it's consumed locally. And the, the brewers will be brewing the same beer style that their families have, have been brewing. And often the, the breweries hand down you know between generations from father to son from father to daughter now as, as well more and more which is nice to see uh, and they're brewing the beer styles and the recipes haven't really changed and they might just brew a hellas and a dunkless so a, a light a lager beer and a, and a dark beer maybe a hefeweizen as well and the question is are these craft beer breweries or not and that just depends on your definition i i think in many respects they are um, but I think variety is now seeping into um, the, the cities where people are discovering, let's say, the, the uh, modern U.S. craft beer style. So let's say the pale ale, IPA uh, and stout. I mean, and for example, I, me, IPA, IPA is the top selling craft beer style here in the United States. It didn't even exist, uh, you know, 20 years ago to, for, for, for all practical purposes, you know. Yes, and, and, and beer does go, through, goes, does go through, through trends. So we are seeing that now, that these new beer styles are being discovered and being brewed by German brewers and international brewers uh, you know, coming to, to Germany. So um, Stone Brewing Company opened up their brewery. Uh, they, you know, they, they launched it three years ago and started brewing last year um, so here in Berlin. And we see BrewDog have now opened their bar. Uh, so, so the craft beer uh, is coming to Germany, but at the same time, it's only been a recent phenomenon. So I was in Berlin. I was at the unveiling of the first continuously brewed uh, American pale ale four years ago. So before 2013, there wasn't a continuously brewed American style pale ale brewed by a Berlin brewery. And now I would say there are about 20 breweries making American pale ale. So you know, it's uh, pale ale with a strong uh, hop aroma using um, American hops or Australian hops. Um, so it's, it's slowly happening here now, but you'll see um, what I call Rory's law of craft brewing is that st- countries with the strongest traditional beer culture are actually the slowest to change. So if you look at, for example, the US and Australia, where there was a really poor historical brewing tradition, um, these were the first to have uh, you know, strong home brewing communities that would then you know, want to brew flavor some beers, flavorful beers, to, to have an alternative to you know, the mass-produced pills that was available. But then if you look at Scandinavia, a little bit closer, they were the next wave uh, to take on craft beer. And then lastly, uh, Great Britain and, and Germany, finally, are the bastions of brewing with these long brewing traditions. And Germany will be the last one to, to, uh, to hold out and, and crumble. So it's, it's slow at the moment. It's, in the US, I think it's worth something like 15, 20% of the beer market at the moment. In Germany, it's less than one percentage. It's, it's, it's very, very slow at the moment. But at the same time, tools like... Um, you know, rate beer untapped, people are able to, to swap uh, their beer experiences with blogs, uh, swap uh, brewing recipes with, for example, Beer Smith. Yeah. Um, so so there, is a, there is a community that's, that's uh, sharing information more and more, sharing knowledge. Um, you know, there are more and more hops in the market, so there's an international community. And it's nice to see that the craft beer so these new styles are coming to Germany as well. But not, let's not forget that there are smaller breweries around Germany that have been brewing by hand, that have been brewing traditional styles, such as, as Hefeweizen, you know, such as uh, different lager styles. And, and those shouldn't be forgotten. And I, I would hate for you know, this new wave and this new interest in beer to forget about these, because I think that's really where the German brewing heritage needs to be protected, is, is in these, these uh, smaller breweries. And unfortunately, they are now aligned... Um, you know, they see craft beer styles, so pale ale, IPA, stout, porter, they say these as, as being challenging to the German beer tradition. I, I want these breweries to keep making exactly what they have, using the exact, exact same um, recipes, the exact same uh, ingredients, you know, as, as they have been doing, um, that they keep these traditions alive. 
Um, but they see themselves now as being challenged by new beer styles, and they're aligning themselves, unfortunately, with the bigger mass-produced, um, you know, pills, German pills, that are that are being brewed by big industrial breweries around Germany. So what we see in Germany today is largely what you saw in the U.S. in the 1960s: is that, you know, commercial in big, large industrial brewers have taken a lot of the flavor out of beer, and because they've been competing mainly on price. So in Berlin today, um, most people will drink pills, and a lot of people will buy the pills that they know or the buy the pills that is the cheapest. And you can get a half liter of pills for as little as 28 euro cents. So that's uh, 30 uh, US cents it was, in your uh, supermarket. Yeah, I've been to Germany a couple of times. It was pretty astounding to me that uh, mm. the beer is basically cheaper than soda or water, which is not the case at yes. all here. Uh, Correct, yes. So, so beer has become a commodity. And if, you're, if your beer is a commodity, um, you know, you want to protect uh, that. You don't want anyone else to come in um, and they're competing mainly on price. And that's why this Reinheitsgebot is being protected and celebrated, is that the beer uh, sales and sales have actually dropped uh, for 10 years in a row in Germany. So if you look at uh, Pils, for example, it has dropped. Um, the numbers have been doctored in the last couple of years because they've included non-alcoholic beer and then Biermischgetränke, so beers mixed with uh, fruit juices and lemonade. Right. But beer, I mean, but consumption in Germany is still one of the largest in the world, one of the highest in the world, isn't it, for beer? It's it's quite high overall, but it's dropping. So young people aren't drinking beer anymore. They're not interested in in, in drinking the you know the, the the beer brand that their fathers drank. So they're moving slowly and slowly to. Um, they're moving over to cider, for example, is now growing quickly. Um, cocktails in the cities, um, spirits, you know, gin and whiskey are coming in as well. Um, and, and beer consumption itself has dropped continuously for the last 10 years. So, I mean, if they're competing on price, as you mentioned, is that really affect uh, a lot of the smaller brewers? I would imagine that's a huge disadvantage for, for as you mentioned, the f small family owned brewers or craft brewers that, that even brew traditional uh, German beers, right? It, it is to a certain extent, but not like what you see happening, for example, uh, at the moment in the craft beer industry. I mean, there isn't any kind of consolidation going on there. Um, in, in Germany, there are basically two sizes of breweries. There's the large uh, national breweries that you know, can distribute amongst the 16 states. And then there are the small family-owned breweries. And there's a huge gap between these two. There are very few uh, medium-sized breweries in between. And the small breweries continue to make beer, uh, you know, they're not expanding, they're just um, making the beer that's sold locally. And the large breweries are making pills, for the most part, as, as cheaply as possible. Now, there are some exceptions. For example, if you take wheat beer brewing, if you look at what Schneider is doing, Schneider brewing in, in uh, Bavaria or Weinstefana, they're making world-class beers. I mean, they're, they're not compromising in any way. But uh, if you look in the north, a lot of the Pillsbury's are, are, are competing. They're not trying to take on, they're not trying to buy up the smaller breweries that just don't have any established brands. Um, it's not really of interest to them. Um, they've almost given up on the German beer market. Um, so for the large German breweries, what they're looking at is the, the export market. So they're looking at, uh, for example, China and India, where they're looking for some authentic product. You know, and it's, it's, it's difficult to, co to have something more authentic than a 500 year old beer law that guarantees the best beer in the world. So this is why the myth is being propagated. You know, the, the market isn't the German market, uh, it's the export market. And German brewers need to continue the myth so that they can sell something special that no other you know, country can, can produce. Well, and I have to say the techniques and the equipment, and uh, you know, I've been to Germany, and uh, it's just astounding. I've, some of the brewing equipment I've seen from Germany is just, uh, you know, really probably the best in the world, I think. That's correct. I mean, if you see the smaller breweries are still using um, breweries that have been around for 100, 120 years. You know, these things were built uh, to specifications, high quality, are still being used uh, in the smaller breweries. The larger breweries, you know, are able to, to build up um, – and they have some of the best brewing uh, equipment manufacturers in the world. I was recently in South Africa, and I saw there, there's in Cape Town, there's a, a real explosion, a new interest in, in um, uh, you know, medium-sized breweries. So I was at a 30-hectoliter system. They're all investing the money in the Rolls Royces of the, the, the beer world, of the brewing equipment uh, world. Um, you know, so they're not afraid to spend the money, and they go straight to Germany uh, for the equipment and also uh, to, to German brewers. So... I think four of the breweries in Cape Town have young German uh, brewmasters there because the, the brewing expertise is also uh, highly respected of, of the, the German trained brewers. Um, now, obviously, the German Brewers Association is a staunch, staunch defender of the law. 
the purity law. And uh, from what I understand, they actually tried to get a UNESCO World Heritage status back in 2014, which I don't fully understand, but um, maybe you can explain that to us. Yeah, this is really interesting. So UNESCO is the body um, of the UN that is working to protect, you know, the, the culture and, and, and traditions. Um, so um, uh, particularly the, since 2005, they've been taking on a non-tangible uh, heritage. So, uh, you know, rather than, than monuments and buildings, they want to take on some of the practices so festivals and dances um, and uh, brewing fits within this, this mandate as well. So in 2013, the German Brewers Association, which is a body that uh, really is at the top of the, the, the brewing industry. It oversees uh, the large commercial breweries, but also is the umbrella body for a lot of the uh, regional brewing associations. So all brewers, uh, willingly and unwillingly, seem to end up being a part of the German Brewers Association. But they, um, in 2013, they, they started a bid to have the purity law, or the Reinheitsgebot, um, the document from 1516, so this myth that we just discussed, they wanted to protect this under UNESCO, um, basically wanted recognition of it as a valuable good for cultural heritage and that it should be protected so that Germany would have something unique. And uh, by the end of 2014, it became clear that this uh, bid was being rejected. Um, and the reasons given by the committee, by the German member of the committee, were that uh, it seemed to have um, restrictions, um, seemed to play too much of a role in, in, in the bid, so that uh, restrictions on brewing practices uh, weren't really part of, of the UNESCO, what they were trying to protect. And also there was a disconnect in modern German brewing from handcrafted beer as it was, you know, historically. So this was the UNESCO basically saying to the German Brewers Association that um, their bid was rejected because, you know, it's they were trying to to use uh, a restriction uh, to you know clear the way for modern industrial brewing uh, to have some kind of a you know some kind of a, a marketing marketing statement. Um, it, it was interesting because in in 2016, so just over a month ago, <laughs> Belgium applied for their beer culture to be protected, and they succeeded in their bid. So at the end of 2016, only two years later, um, Belgium was accepted, and uh, Belgian beer culture, very specifically, is now protected under UNESCO. And uh, if you look at the UNESCO ruling, they say things like, um, you know, Belgian beer culture is worth protecting because Belgium has a wonderful brewing culture. Beer and food pairings, you know, uh, the Trappist beers, um, beer education, um, the variety of styles, you know, 1,500 different yeah, it's beers. Like, it's like the Disneyland of beers, really. Exactly. And this is something worth celebrating. So, you know, uh, Belgian beer culture in, in its different forms, of course, there are commercial breweries there. There are some brewing, you know, low quality pills on, on a massive scale. But what was what UNESCO was protecting is is the positive contributions of the Belgian brewers and the Belgian beer drinkers and, you know, the communities there sharing home home brew recipes. Um, all of this is worth preserving. And this is in direct contrast to what uh, the German Brewers Association was trying to protect. Um, so I believe that if Germany uh, really was interested in protecting its German um, beer culture, you could protect things like you know, the Oktoberfest, like the uh, discovery of bottom fermentation techniques, of the bottom fermenting yeast, of Rauchbier, of the, the brewing style around Franken, of, you know, the beer drinking vessels, of the Maibock, the different seasonal beers, of Kölsch, of Düsseldorfer Alt, of Gose, of Grezza. You know, Germany has a really, really wonderful beer culture and maybe second to none in the world. But none of these things are being celebrated because we're all at the mercy of this, this, this engine that's trying to export more beer by propagating a myth. Well, uh, I would argue, though, that the German purity law is certainly a central piece of German heritage, and uh, certainly the brewing traditions that go back hundreds of years are, are very central to, to the German culture. Yes, yeah, so I, I do think so, but I think we, we need to... We need to um... We need to celebrate the authentic brewing heritage, so the actual culture, and celebrate the individual elements. So uh, tell Germans about their brewing culture rather than say that the purity law is responsible for the quality of German beer. Because German 
Germans technically do still brew good beer. Even a lot of the mass-produced beers have a, I would, I would argue, a, a higher technical quality or fewer flaws than some brewed uh, internationally. Um, but if those are, were, you know, if these are, if uh, beer drinkers want to consume these, then it's because the brewer themselves was responsible for producing a good quality product. What's often forgotten are the regionally brewed beers. So very few Germans are going out of the way to look for a nice Helles. Are uh, nobody's drinking Berliner Weisse and uh, Düsseldorfer Alt and and uh, Kölsch are that was, drunk. Uh, that was a question I want to ask you. Where you know when the when the purity law was uh, was enacted across Germany in 1906, did we lose some traditional beer styles? No, I think the way the the laws have been updated, it's uh, those have been to protect what was being brewed. So they made sure that, for example. Um, the wheat beer brewing, Hefeweizen, uh, Weiss beer brewing, was protected, as was Kölsch and Düsseldorfer Alt. So they didn't run any of the beer styles into the ground. Um, you know, wheat beer was beer brewing was a monopoly for 250 years of the last 500 years, which is often forgotten. But um, that was to do with you know how tax laws and how monopolies work in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries. Um, the way the modern beer laws are applied, they made sure they didn't want to stop any anybody brewing. But there are a few cases that I can give you where where the law was challenged. So, for example. One example is the, the the Brandenburg beer war of the uh, 1980s. So there 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 was a, a dark beer, um, Dunkel, that was made with two percent inverted sugar. That has actually did historically have uh, a recipe that was formulated this way, and uh, the modern uh, beer laws. Um, so from it would be the 1953 beer law would have stopped them using inverted sugar for this bottom fermented beer style. And this was challenged and later became known as the Brandenburg Beer War, where the brewery then was allowed to, to continue to brew their dark beer. That was one example where, where um, you know, historic beer style was was blocked because of the, the modern uh, laws. Um, yeah, um, and once another example of where we're seeing seeing it today is uh, in in Bavaria. There's a, a brewing manufacturing, uh, sorry, a brewing equipment manufacturer called Braukon, and they have a brewery called Kamba Bavaria, and they've tried to brew a milk stout. I mean, they successfully brewed a milk stout and packaged it. Uh, they have a wide variety of beers, um, so they brew you know Belgian triples and IPAs and pale ales, um, and this milk stout was challenged because uh, as Probably many of your your viewers and, and uh, listeners will already know milk stout contains lactose, which goes against the purity law. Um, and being an un, unmalted sugar, you could say, um, they weren't allowed to use this. So Camba Bavaria was blocked from selling this product as as beer. Um, and as often is the case, then the question is, is you know, how does the, the consumer on the street see this? And in this case, it was uh, deemed that the, any consumer would, would see the milk stout as beer anyway, so they couldn't even rename it and sell it. So what they did instead was they went across the border and had the beer gypsy brewed in Austria and then re-imported it, packaged it and sold it as milk stout again. Um, so there are, there are ways around the law, you know, um, yeah. but it is, it is slowly being challenged by, by, by different breweries. Now, I assume there's no serious legislative attempts to actually uh, get a change, right? No, at the moment, it's only individual brewers are tackling it. And uh, here it is worth pointing out that um, the, the modern law, so since 1993, it, it is allowed to have what are called uh, regional or specialty beers brewed. So the law does allow brewers to apply for special beer status. So you could say that uh, something, for example, uh, a Leipziger Gose, which does use some coriander um, and sometimes salt uh, in, in the water, um, uh, that this uh, beer style has six historical significance. And you can apply for an exception. And you need to be granted the exception for that particular beer, but then you can brew that style and you can continue to, be, to brew that beer style as an exception. So it does allow for this. But of course, um, this again is playing into the hands of the larger breweries because as many small breweries do when they're, Brewing historical beer styles; these are seasonals. They're not, you know, turning over a, a, a percentage of their production into this. It's not like they can plan three, six months in advance to apply for the exception. Um, I know brewers in Berlin who, you know, formulate their recipes on brew day as they are pouring the ingredients into the mash tun. And for those brewers, they can't apply for the exception for every single, uh, you know, seasonal beer that they're brewing. Um, so it, it, this again, it plays into the hands of the large brewers who might want to brew. Um, a Goza or occasionally a Belgian triple as has had occurred 
but not for the small brewers who can't apply for an exception every single yeah, time. Yeah, I mean, we, we have nano breweries here locally that, you know, they brew a different beer every day almost. It's uh, yeah. pretty astounding. It's fun, though, because you go in there and they've always got something new. It is. And, and this kind of freedom, again, for 99% of the beer drinkers in Germany, this won't really be an, an issue because they're at the moment they're interested in Pilsen. and eventually they'll be interested in pale ale, IPA, hopefully stout and some Belgian stout. And all of these can be brewed according to the, the, the law. So in that sense, the law itself isn't restricting them. Very few beer drinkers, I can see for the foreseeable future, are going to be clamoring for, you know, beers brewed with Heather or Braggots or, you know, beers brewed with Juniper. Um, it's the architecture of how this restriction is enforced that is the problem. It's not that, you know, all brewers should be brewing, uh, you know, throw caution to the wind and, and be throwing everything into their mash tun. Yeah. Um, it's right. the fact that it's an artificial badge of quality when it, you know, it clearly isn't that, that, that I think is the problem here. So it seems like uh, living in Berlin, you must be fighting an uphill battle. You probably get, <laughs> do you get a lot of hate mail every day? Or? I, so in the last year, there's been a lot of discussion about it and people are blue in the face and tired of talking about it. Um, and, you know, people have become very entrenched. There, there's the staunch advocates of the Reinhardt Gebot in the industry who, you know, they just talk talk down to you and don't want to engage in any of the details of the conversation. Then there are the angry brewers who you know, want to have the freedom to brew whatever they like. Um, I'm independent and I'm not associated with any brewery, so I can be a little bit like a gadfly, so I can get a little bit of, uh, of an argument uh, where other brewers might be a little bit shy. Um, a lot of the brewers th themselves will tell me privately how they feel, but they don't want to come out publicly because they're afraid that it might damage their reputation. And at the moment, most German beer drinkers would be in favor of the Reinheitsgebot because they don't really understand the, the, the truth behind it. So it, it is an interesting debate. And being in Berlin, I mean, Berlin was always a kind of rebellious city and there's an international community here. So it's interesting to see what's happening here at the moment. In Bavaria, in the, in the south, so particularly around Munich or around Bamberg, there they're very protective of their brewing heritage and they think that's synonymous with Reinheitsgebot. So there I would be less likely to have a, a public debate. Um, because I think there it's just worth celebrating what they actually, you know, brew, particularly in, in, in Bamberg and, and the breweries around Bamberg. Yeah, in, I mean, Franco. you might get tarred and feathered or something, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, I have received hate mail and I have had uh, pub public spats, particularly via Twitter, with uh, different export managers of large breweries who claim to be independent, and, you know, but if they're... Um, if their sales bonuses are dependent on the export market, I think it's pretty clear what side of the argument they're going to be arguing on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, uh, I'm actually coming up to the end of the timeline here, Rory, but I just wanted if you had a, a second or two closing thoughts. Yeah, again, I think the reason we're having this conversation is, of course, the 500-year the anniversary, but it's, it's worth pointing out again that Germany is a wonderful uh, brewing tradition and it is worth coming to, if any of your listeners uh, or viewers have never been to Germany, it is worth coming to Germany. It's, and well, worth, it's well worth it for the beer, I can, I can attest to that. Yeah, and they should seek out the small regional breweries, particularly around the, the, in Franconia, around the Bamberg area, brewing fantastic beers. You'll get, when, particularly when beer is fresh, as, as something like a Helles beer that hasn't been pasteurized. I mean, that's really where the German craft is. Again, German brewers making Hefeweizen, and I still think are the best in the world. My own favorites would be Schneider and Wein Stefana. Um, so the, this, this uh, positive contribution to, to the beer world is worth celebrating. Um, I think uh, for the Reinheitsgebot, but we really should look towards removing the, re the, the legal framework um, and allowing brewers to be a little bit more creative, but that will take a little bit more time. Uh, so for me, the priority at the moment is just educating Germans on their own positive beer culture. Um, and then finally, the German Brewers Association is, is only really representing um, the larger breweries, even though they claim to be representing all aspects of German brewing culture. And I just think the, the German brewing tradition and German brewing heritage is in the wrong hands there. And that uh, for UNESCO, for example, another bid should be made that celebrates the positive as aspects of German brewing. Um, but, um, yeah, let's not forget in Germany as well, since I'm based in Berlin, that uh, we shouldn't keep these walls up, that uh, the German beer drinkers should also be encouraged to try other beer styles, like British beer styles and, and Belgian beer styles, and that ultimately variety is the spice of life, and uh, it becomes more interesting when, you know, there's this variety is available in Germany too. Well, Rory, uh, thank you for joining us. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to uh, Rory Lawton. He's joining us today from uh, Berlin.
Roy is a writer in Berlin uh, working to challenge uh, the status of German purity, purity laws. Uh, certainly an uphill battle, but, uh, but good luck with that. Thanks, Roy. Well, a big thank you to Rory Lawton for joining me this week from Berlin. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue is packed with great information for homebrewers and craft beer fans. Take advantage of their fantastic sale and get a one-year subscription now for only $19.99 at beerandbrewing.com. And also Blickman Engineering, creators of the innovative new BrewVision wireless thermometer. Remotely monitor your brewing system from your iPhone or iPad. Record data, set alerts, and grab recipes directly from the BeerSmith cloud. The BrewVision thermometer, another innovation from BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, BeerSmith software, the industry standard for home and professional brewers. It lets you design great beer recipes and brew with confidence. Download your free 21-day trial today from BeerSmith.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm-hmm.